Thank you, Lord, I whimpered in relief as I saw light in the distance. The cover of black dust made it stand out. The heavens flashed with lightning, tearing the belly of clouds open, and I could see the road ahead, even though it wasn't so helpful. The clouds broke and belted a rugged roar that shook me, and I twitched. My gaze blurred out onto the road, slippery and glistening, witnessed the heavy downpour that made my traveling difficult. It was not the fact that my stomach rumbled when I pulled over into the Hooters, as much as the need for human company in the cold, stormy night that made me grin with satisfaction. I scanned the parking lot, and it had three cars, but I was stuck by an unassuming Toyota truck that had been beaten in the rain. I blubbered my lips and made a sharp, shrill noise when I pulled my car beside the Toyota truck. I switched off the engine, and the heavens melted the noisy growl again. I ducked from the sheer force of thunder. When the noise stopped, I switched my vehicle off and rubbed my hands together for heat. I pushed the door open and the wind whistled past my face with the dash of rain pouring with it. I knew better now than to hesitate. I slammed the door quickly and pressed the keys to shut it. Then I rushed to the hooters with my head bowed, drifting in the rain. The door yawned noisily when I pushed it open and dry air unexpected but familiar, struck me. I filled my lungs with it, and my face turned hot from the sensations. I flailed my hands and again rubbed my palms together. I looked throughout the hooters, and there he was, a man so pale-faced. I sensed he was stunned by my presence. His eyes fixed on my frame and did not move. I froze in perplexity and looked around. To the extreme right of the stall counter, a blonde-haired girl stood, flushing so pink in contrast to the man's face. On second glance, I noticed his brows were bleached blonde, but it was only the beginning of their similarity. I swallowed nervously. We are closed, the man said in a flat tone. I swung my attention to the blonde and noticed her eyes twitch. My body turned warm as sensation slipped through the patches of my skin, gripping my core and stroking me between adventure or escape. M my bad, I muttered back, careful not to show how shaken I was from panic and cold. What do you want? The blonde asked me. I cocked my head to the side and my brows jumped. She sensed my consternation, and I assumed she thought to put me at ease because her next move was so sultry. It did not seem part of her job to do so. The wires had gone off in my head already. Take a seat, we have got food, she said, and looked over to the man who was with her. My mind drifted, my hands began to quiver. I was in trouble and it was not difficult to identify. The horrors of that evening had lined up so perfectly in their elements that I wondered how I had missed it. A stormy night, alone but inviting cafe in the middle of the trip, strange looking people offering food and drinks. Hooters did not offer in such a manner without an item book. Panic shook me to my bones. The patter of the rain worsened outside in the Hooters, flogging as wickedly as the storm that brewed in my chest. I could scarcely breathe from fright so I knew an attempted escape would only worsen things. My ears weird and I swung into action. What do you have? Burgers? I burst into a stride towards the counter, grinning to conceal how wrecked I was inside from terror. I maintained my attention on the man, but I never took my eyes off her. Beer? Get a seat. The man hollered at me when I stepped too close to the counter stretching his hands out to dissuade my approach. I scowled, holding her gaze while her partner moved forward. Her shoulders dropped. My chest heaved from fright, but I steadied myself with the knowledge that I had made them as uncomfortable as I was. If that was ketchup or blood, it looks equally beautiful on you, I pointed out, and she blanched. 
I could hold my fear no longer. I heaved dryly, and my entire character fell apart. My vision blurred. Lightning struck out, followed by an immediate thunder, and it rocked all three of us. In desperation, I turned around, peeling my feet off the ground as quickly as I could. Get back here, she squealed, and immediately they were onto me. I saw the man run after me from the corner of my eyes, and in that moment, I sent the floor in front of me pull apart, and the mud of the earth slowing down my stride. I pushed my upper body forward, running, and clumsily kicked my feet over themselves. What followed was the tumultuous crash from behind over my fallen frame. I did not see it happen, but I heard the crack. A body pushed beyond its limits, colliding with the hard steel of bars of a chair. <clears throat> his lips blasted, and a huge gash appeared on his head from the injury. His body rocked on the floor violently, and in one adrenaline-fueled moment, I rushed to his side and seized the knife in his hands without resistance. Stop right there! I hollered at the blonde who turned around to run away when she saw her partner incapacitated on the floor. She swung right around, and I saw her eyes red with heat and malevolence. You should have just died, just like the rest of Hooters, she said in a vain note. The apron on her lower body was stained with dry blood, and my tongue struck the roof of my mouth to hold back the horror I felt. I looked down at his body, and he was still, even as blood seeping from his head dwindled. Die, she said, and drummed straight at me in my distraction. My eyes swung open at the dreaminess of all of that that had happened, and one word filtered into my senses as I resisted the urge to investigate their crime. Leave. I raced to my car in the heavy storm to shake off the horror. The other day, my boyfriend Tim complained that whenever we went out to eat, I was the one who always chose the restaurant. I didn't realize I did that, but I guess he was right. So I told him that the next time we go out for dinner, we could go wherever he wanted to go. And you know where he took me? Hooters. The one restaurant I never expected myself to eat at. Honestly, when he said it, I thought he was joking. But no, he was dead serious. And since I'd already agreed, I couldn't say no. So that Saturday, I came back from my afternoon yoga class and Tim drove us to Hooters. The whole drive there, he talked about how excited he was. He'd always wanted to go. He assured me that the food was good. Whatever. I just wanted to get it over with. When we got there, it didn't seem too bad. There wasn't any line and the building seemed pretty nice. But when we got inside and asked for a table for two, Tim looked around the place and his whole expression changed. Um, I've changed my mind, he said. Let's go somewhere else. No, I told him. We're already here. It's okay, he said. I know you didn't really want to come here. I don't know what caused him to do a total 180, but it didn't matter. We were here, I was hungry, and we were going to eat. The voluptuous hostess took us back to a table near the bar, and we sat down. Tim kept looking around, visibly nervous. I asked him if anything was wrong, and once again, he said that we should go somewhere else. We didn't. We waited there for a couple of minutes until a blonde waitress came up to ask for our drink orders. She seemed friendly, but she barely even looked at me. She focused all her attention on Tim. I assumed that was what the waitresses at Hooters were trained to do. They gave all their attention to the male customers, and they probably got better tips that way. We ordered, and the waitress left. It didn't take long for our drinks to arrive. The waitress gave me my margarita, but when she was handing Tim his beer, she accidentally dropped the bottle right on his lap. His pants were soaked. She kept apologizing, and he just said, It's okay, it's okay, over and over again. The waitress suggested that Tim go to the bathroom to dry off. They had air dryers in there. Tim thanked her and said he was fine. Just go, I told him. You can't sit here in wet clothes. He tried to think of an excuse, but when he couldn't think of anything, 
got up and left. As he was going, he told the waitress to get him another beer. She said that she would, but he wouldn't leave until she walked back to the bar. Obviously, Tim was acting really weird. I had no idea why, but once he was gone, I found out. The waitress hurried back to the table and told me that she'd spilled his beer on purpose. She wanted to talk to me, alone. What's going on? I asked. Your boyfriend and I have been sleeping together for months now, she explained. I'm so sorry. He always said he was single, but I never really believed it. I wasn't going to say anything, but you seem so nice, so I just had to tell you. She was going to say something else, something important, but she saw Tim exit the bathroom and she scurried off. Now, everything made sense. Why he acted so nervous, why he wanted to leave the restaurant as soon as we got here. Tim sat down and asked, Did the waitress come back while you were gone? Not yet. I lied. I think she's still getting your beer. She seems nice, so I hope you're okay if we tip her a lot, even though she spilled on you. He looked at me suspiciously. Yeah, he said. That should be fine. The rest of our dinner went pretty smoothly. We got our food, which was delicious by the way, and the waitress treated us like any other customers. Tim was on edge the whole time, but I just pretended like absolutely nothing was wrong. When the bill came, the waitress gave the tray to me. I could tell from her expression that she wanted me to have it. Tim tried to reach for the bill, but I swatted his hand away. You're such an amazing boyfriend, I told him. You always treat me so well, and since the restaurant was your choice, I like to treat you. He didn't argue. I looked over the bill, which wasn't too expensive, and then noticed that she'd written something on the back of the customer's copy. Tim was staring at me, so I shoved the customer's copy in my pocket to read it later. As I promised, I gave the woman a very big tip. It wasn't her fault that my boyfriend was a cheating scumbag. As we drove back home, Tim seemed relieved. He was proud of himself for getting through the dinner without being caught. He had no idea that I knew everything. When we got back home, I went to the bathroom to finally read the hidden message on our receipt. It just looked like a bunch of letters and numbers, but I eventually figured out that it was the URL address to some website. I pulled out my phone and typed in the address. I couldn't believe it. It was a dress where Tim dressed in different animal costumes and performed all kinds of explicit acts on a bunch of different people, not just the waitress. He was selling these videos and he didn't go by his own name. He called himself The Stallion. Horrified, I silently left the bathroom, gathered up my stuff and walked out of the house without saying a word. Tim tried to call me a bunch of times after that, but I didn't answer. I had no idea that one trip to Hooters would make me realize what a disgusting, cheating sleazebag my boyfriend was. I had just lost my job and really needed some money. I asked my twin sister Brandy for advice, and she suggested that I start an OnlyFans account. I was shocked at the suggestion. I didn't want to be an adult star. But then she reassured me that I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do, and that there were all different types of OnlyFans accounts, not just X-rated stuff. That got me convinced. I created an account that day. I won't tell you what I did on camera, but it really wasn't that bad. I didn't have to compromise my morals, and the money started rolling in pretty fast. After a few months, I was able to dig myself out of debt. I was also working as a waitress at the time, so I figured that I was ready to close down my OnlyFans and just make money from waitressing. When I told Brandy this, she got really excited and gave me a big hug. She seemed happy that I was quitting OnlyFans, even though it was her idea in the first place. We got on my laptop and Brandy helped me close my account without deleting it, just in case I decide to reopen it later. I told her that I wasn't planning to go back to OnlyFans ever again, but she insisted. After that, things were going great. I eventually forgot about OnlyFans completely. Then about a year later, my car completely broke down. Once again, I needed money fast, so I decided to reopen my account. I got on my laptop after work and logged back into OnlyFans. At first, I thought I'd gone to the wrong website. The account had hundreds of videos, once as recently as the day before. But I looked at the name and avatar, and it was definitely my account. Someone else had been using it. 
I clicked on the first video and almost threw up. It was a video of Brandy smiling at the camera as she cut up a human body. I closed the video before it got too bloody. I was physically sick to my stomach, but I had to see if all these videos were like that. I clicked on another one, and this time Brandy had a guy chained up in a small room. I clicked through more of the videos, each one worse than the last. They showed my sister filming herself as she stalked people, kidnapped them, and murdered them. And at the beginning of each video, she always introduced herself using my name. Brandy and I were identical twins, and she was dressed like me in all the videos. No one would be able to tell the difference between us, not even our closest friends. I told myself that it was a joke, but the videos all looked so real. I had to talk to Brandy. I called her and asked her if she could come over. I knew I should have called the police then and there, but I had to give my sister a chance to explain herself. She arrived half an hour later. I tried to act cool, but she could tell right away that I was upset. I closed the front door behind her and her expression got very serious. You know, don't you? I didn't know how to respond. She was scaring me. You saw your OnlyFans account, didn't you? Is, is it real? I asked her. You mean the murders? Yes, you've killed four people so far. Our subscribers are going crazy. Why? I asked. And how? How are you getting away with it? I'm not, she said. You are. It's your account. You haven't been arrested yet. But one day you will. I don't know what came over me. I lunged at her and threw her to the ground. Then I started hitting her as hard as I could, over and over. I'd never fought anyone before in my life, but finding out that my twin sister betrayed me like this was all the motivation I needed. I punched her again, but she twisted out of the way and grabbed me from the side. She held me for a bit as she dug for something in her pocket. Then I felt her stick a needle into my arm and I blacked out. I woke up on the floor of a dark room. I was tied to the wall like the men in her videos. There was an empty bucket in the corner and a camera on a tripod that pointed right at me. On the other side of the room was a nurse's cart filled with all kinds of sharp surgical tools, scalpels, knives, and clamps. I screamed for help until my throat hurt. Brandy, dressed in my clothes, walked into the room and laughed. You don't think anyone will hear you, right? I've soundproofed everything. I looked around. I'd been to my sister's house many times, but I didn't recognize the room. I assumed I was in her basement, the one room I'd never seen. What are you going to do to me? I asked. You know the answer. You've seen my videos, she said. I'm going to kill you. I'm your cover, I said. If people see you kill me, then you won't have anyone to take the fall when you get caught. She thought for a second. Maybe I convinced her. Then she laughed and said, No one's going to see this video. This one's just for me. She grabbed a giant pair of pliers from her cart and started walking toward me. You're my sister, I muttered. Why are you doing this? She didn't answer. She got really close and started snipping the pliers in front of my face. I couldn't push her away because the ropes were holding my arms down. I twisted my body to see how tight the restraints were, and my left foot somehow got loose. I don't know how that happened. I guess the knot just wasn't tied completely. If I timed it right, I could kick her, but I doubted that it would do much damage. Then I had an idea. Brandy, I said, before you kill me, don't you want my feedback on your videos? Let me guess. You hate them? Yes, I said. But if your fans are watching for the violence, don't you think they want to see all the tools you're working with? Why don't you bring your card in front of the camera? She looked at me suspiciously, but I guess she thought that it was good advice because she wheeled the medical cart into the center of the room, right behind her. That's exactly what I wanted her to do. She crouched toward me, waving her pliers in front of my mouth. Now which tooth should I take first? She asked herself. That's when I kicked as hard as I could. I aimed for her left knee, the one that she'd messed up on a skiing trip a few years back. She stumbled backwards into the medical cart. 
both her and the cart toppled onto the floor, sending her scalpels and knives sliding away. In the fall, one of her knives had sliced across her hand and wrist. Blood oozed out. Using my free foot, I scooted a fallen scalpel closer to me, and then grabbed it with my tied hands. Like in the movies, I cut into my ropes until my hands were free. Then I untied my other foot. By then, Brandy had wrapped her wounded hand in a cloth and started coming for me again. She grabbed me by the throat. But I still had that scalpel, and even though she was my sister, I stabbed her in the stomach. She screamed horribly and then fell back to the ground. I ran out of there, back into Brandy's living room. I found my cell on her coffee table and called the police. This all happened three months ago. Since then, the police have taken down the videos and created a task force to investigate all the people who subscribe to Brandy's videos. Brandy has been locked up in a mental health facility ever since. I still don't know why she did everything she did, but I refuse to visit her. I'm not ready yet. The house I grew up in. It was derelict now, but the memories held out firmly as the very structure fell apart over the years as it was left abandoned. My family moved out one night, one that we could never forget. The only part of our family that ever remained there, it was never found. Or rather, they were never found. Back in the year 1989, me, my older sister Clara, my older brother Tom, and of course my parents, Mary and George, had been living in our now old home in Texas for just about five months. It was a home filled with history and had lived through several world wars and even a couple eras of time, but had only ever had one family live in it until that family had one day disappeared. Their stories left untold by the police who were never able to find out where they had vanished to or why. But the house, being so old and lost in time, was priced at a suitable amount that my family, who had just lost our earlier home to a fire, was somehow able to afford, regardless of the fact that it was incredibly cheap. We moved in with what little furniture we had left, and after just a month of living there, the nights grew darker, and by the fifth month we decided to leave. One last straw was all it took and we retreated to the bounds of external family just to survive, though we had lost one of us to the old home. But tonight, I would return to that terrible place. I needed closure of what truly happened that night. I needed to know where my sister's body was, and most of all, why, why she had been taken. Harry, you can't go back! You know exactly what happened there, and you still want to return? Mary was furious at the fact that I wanted to return. She'd already lost one family member and was far too afraid of losing another. You know why. Clara's still there. She deserves a proper goodbye, not just some pathetic family abandoning her to save themselves. We had been arguing about it for weeks, so much so that the feud between us had fractured what little stability our family had left. My brother had left home, and my dad was off doing his best to rebuild the family economy at his new job, leaving me and Mary to argue day in and day out in regards to returning. And it doesn't matter, Mary, I'm going. You can't stop me. Harry, if you dare return to that godforsaken place, then you'll have no family to come home to. Make your choice. Clara didn't get that choice, Mary, but I'll give her one final goodbye. I stormed out of the house shortly after, hopping on the next coach ride to Texas that came. And after around two days of travel, I was there, back at that place I had long left abandoned. I'm coming, Clara. The front door was open in the same position we had left it. There were no houses for miles, and the bus station was over an hour's walk away, so it was best I go in and get out whilst the sun was still up. I crept in, opening the door further, verging on snapping off its hinges out of hatred for the place. The main hall had crumbled with time. The stairwells, railings had rotted, and I could make out a couple family portraits hanging from all the walls. Some left up, 
Others had been dropped to the floor, with scratch marks covering them all over. Hello? I called out. I was hopeful to hear my sister's voice call back. But sometimes hope returns with only more pain as the withered noise of wind flying through the windows called back. I steadily clampered up the stairs, picturing Tom chasing me and Clara down the stairs after we had gone in and annoyed him into playing with us. Uh, such fond memories boosted my motivation to find her. I knew she was here, somewhere. I carefully went inside and examined the rooms. Each had been left full of our possessions, books laid on the floor. But one door, one door right at the end of the upstairs corridor remained locked. And the flashback of the night suddenly hit me. The house was silent as slumber consumed it. I was momentarily aroused from my sleep as I heard footsteps creep past my door. Then a voice in my ear whispered, Get out. I snapped my neck to the side, seeing nothing was there. Then, all of a sudden, the shrieking began. The house shook with the ear-piercing siren of someone or something screeching. The noise appeared to come from Clara's room as we all burst into the corridor, unaware of what was happening as our eyes were drawn to Clara's room. Her light was on. She managed to step out into the hallway, but behind her rose a shadow. We couldn't make out who or what this thing was, but it was definitely something evil. Something which didn't belong to this world. The figure approached her from behind and grabbed her back into the room. The door slammed shut and her voice screamed in terror as we tried smashing the door open. Until suddenly, the screaming stopped. Leave her and I will spare your lives. My dad grabbed Tom and Mary grabbed me. They snatched us away from the door as it began to shake from the other side. We sprinted down the stairs and out of the house. As we stood near the car, we looked up to the window of her room and saw a shadowy figure staring back at us, gesturing us to leave the house, and then it pulled the curtains. And now, after several months, here I was, face to face with that same door. I was here to free her. or. So I thought. I tiptoed towards the door, making as little noise as possible. The stained area beneath the door released a foul stench. And as I pushed it open, I felt a weight pushing against it. After what felt like an eternity of struggle and grit, I finally managed to force my way in. Only to see that there was nothing behind the door at all. No corpse and no Clara. I turned on my flashlight. And upon releasing the beams of light into the room, I gasped at the sight of the walls around me. They were slobbered in mold, and the place smelled awful as I crept around the corner, carefully watching my footing in case some kind of entity was waiting for me, ready to strike. As I moved the light towards Clara's bed, I had to cover my mouth just to resist vomiting. There, laying in Clara's bed, was a familiar skeleton with some flesh still latched onto its skull. The sight alone was so unbearable that my instant reaction was to turn away and run. She was dead. There was nothing here for me anymore. But as I swiveled round, a hand laid its fingers upon my shoulder and then whispered in my ear, I told you to get out. I launched myself past it, not daring to look back and stampeded down the stairs. My heart was on the verge of a meltdown from the utter mortification of who could have possibly just said that. And finally, my deepest fears were confirmed. It was real. Now sprinting out of the house, I could hear a stomping pair of footsteps chasing me. I was evidently faster and had a few moments to clear the door. After I had escaped the house, I continued running until I was at least 20 feet away. Then I turned back, only to see the curtains of Clara's room being reopened, revealing that 
wicked entity once more. Never return. Never return. <laughs> <laughs>